uh, some of the nerve interfaces, uh, and I talk tomorrow. Um, right now, so uh, recording from nerves directly is very, very difficult, is the problem. The signals are just too small, and that's why we don't have Luke Skywalker hands. Um, but, you know, I, so we're using uh, muscles, uh, muscles as amplifiers, but then actually using an invasive wire to get at the signal. And so that's what, that's what I think the future is going to be. And it's, it's very similar to targeted muscle reiteration, except uh, targeted muscle reiteration with an implant. Um, the, the surface treatment for the titanium, uh, in some instances, I'm not sure if this is in all of them, um, in, in some instances, they're able to, the, for, for implanted titanium, let's say. I'm not, uh, so I, I, um, I'm not certain what they're doing at the termination of the cell, but in implanted titanium components, where they're doing bone replacement, they coat them with a biocompatible ceramic. So yeah. I don't know the particulars of that. But, so I imagine that's something they can do. Yeah, what are the types of you've got? Oh, cool. Thank you. What are the same material you've used for uh, dental implants? Um, it's very similar, actually. actually. It's a, there's different ceramics that you can use, and you can go to one of the ceramic conferences. There's one in Daytona, which is, I go to it every year. We do our jet engine research, and then the next presentation is someone doing dental implants and scratch resistant. And you never know that these fields are connected. But um, yeah, so there is an artificial bone chemical that they made called hydroxyapatite, which is almost identical to your bones. Where do they use that? Uh, yeah, I think you were new. Sure. Um, we've all heard of you know the six million dollar manly majors, and uh, number one is if that was going to happen today, what would you be now? Not the six million dollar man. <laughs> would it be the six billion dollar man or the six trillion dollar man? Yeah. Um, and the number two, uh, it's you know, part of the question, insurance company. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> is, is there some type of code of ethics as far as not making them superhuman? Because we majors with superhuman powers above the human. Uh, can you talk about the ethics of potentially going that route? Yeah. Um, this is, I'd like to jump in on that first, because this is something uh, my students and I actually talked about. In some applications, I think they could be very positive. Why not give somebody that, that has um, a, 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 a limb difference the ability to do something beyond what we can do with our normal hands? So like one, a very easy one would be putting very finely tuned vibration sensors. You could just do it with PVDF, which is a pretty cheap material. It's what sits on microphones. Um, if you put that into the fingertips and put wires to it, and then gave them an amplifier and a headphone jack, they could touch walls and hear what was on the other side. I mean, you know, and that, that would be a pretty inexpensive hack, actually. So, there's some privacy concerns. And there's, there, well, there's, you know, but you can do the same thing in another method, but, but it, it, could, it could be privacy concerns, or it could have applications in law enforcement. You know, like, like the value hostage situation, you want to hear privacy what's on. Yeah. Yeah. Hostage situation. <laughs> yeah. Clearly, clearly, you can put, like, clearly you can define where we're in the application. These are prosthetics. Yeah, so, so it, does raise, it does raise ethical concerns, but there's also room for positive to be in, in there. So, uh, but now on to the, 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 the sort of. Uh, I should say, I look yeah. forward to having that problem. <laughs> um, right now, like, I mean, you know, the, the neural prostheses are not nearly as good as able body. So it's not a problem um, right now. Um, so, but on the other hand, yeah, we sort of we don't. Uh, I guess the short answer is, you know, everything that's in the works now in terms of academic research is all aimed at a medical problem. So uh, we don't really <laughs> enhancement is in science fiction. Right. Yeah. First, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you were next. Yeah. Go ahead. What is the technology right now as far as creating like tactile sensation? Uh, this was actually published this year, um, and they're using either heat or voltage to be able to do this, and they have had a lot of advances in synthetic uh, tactile feeling, and it's incredible, I think, what is going to come out of this. Yeah, well, so the interesting thing there is, so I said nerves are really hard to record from, but they're actually very easy to stimulate. So there's a couple of clinical trial sites on University of Utah and Case Western, um, where they have implants on a nerve and they're able to recreate through electrical stimulation a very naturalistic and very localized sensation on the hand. Um, and so there's a video, if you YouTube, there's a video of somebody pulling cherry, you know, stems off of cherries using sensation and like grabbing, you know, feeling around for where objects are. And so that actually has gone faster than the motor control because stimulation is easier, easier than recording. So. You, oh, yeah. Um, Okay, you sorry. Oh, coming a little further with that, um, do especially with, with the kids with the, with the greater neuroplasticity, do they show any degree of uh, proprioception um, with these limbs in your experience, or do they have to watch where it's going? 
that, that does seem to actually occur. Where, where um, there was a weird, a weird study done, I forget which university in California, where they hooked people up to people with with all their fingers, you know, their intact limbs, put a very large mechanical puppet hand onto them, and had them do tasks where the the the, the study participants were asked to interact with objects. Um, before before doing it, they would touch two points on their hand and ask them to estimate how large their hand was. You know, just okay, tell us how how far apart these two points feel to you. Um, but they have them interact and using this giant hand for 30 minutes, grabbing objects and interacting with things. Then a, then they did the same test afterward, and it, it appeared just from 30 minutes of using an artificial hand on their intact hand, um, they had a perception of their hand being larger. After that. Uh, so when they were asked to estimate that distance, they interpreted it as being well, larger than, than before the test. Um, same thing with a lot of the kids that are using at least body power devices. You see them starting to not have to look at objects. They'll look at the object here, oh, I want to get this, and then do the thing you know, that, 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 that they're trying to accomplish. So it, it does appear to have some impact there. But that's also not, um, that's also in keeping with studies that have been done on carpenters that have been using a hammer for a long time. It appears they actually think of the hammer as an extension of their limb. Uh, that, that's why they can very accurately hit a, a, a small target at distance. So we, we've seen with, with Alex, uh, every time he gets an upgrade in arm, he starts all over again, is what it, it almost seems. And he doesn't trust it to pick up what he's doing. And so he, he keeps his other arm ready to be there, or he'll hold it as if it suddenly got heavier. And then if you distract him, and he's not thinking about it, he goes back to being totally you know, independent. Um, and that was at age six or seven. And he is a birth, it was a birth defect, so we're not sure if it was because those parts of his brain have never been wired before. Um, at least to there, that's our understanding. Maybe there is some, but um, Wyatt was, uh, was an amputee, and he has not really shown any signs of needing the other hand. It's completely independent. And just in the videos we, I saw, because I, I wasn't there in person, but, and you can, you can add to that, um, he doesn't seem to have any of that challenge. It's, it was much more easy for him to pick up so I don't know, there's a difference in age, there's a difference in, in the condition, and you know, two points does not make uh, good statistics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, um, I was gonna ask about the sort of an ethical, but also mechanical thing of, uh, so, so you get a hacker space that wants to help kids, they want to fit the prosthetic properly. I'm assuming you guys are suggesting that if they find a doctor or his doctor, you know, somebody who's gonna help you appropriately fit the prosthetics. Um, so that don't, you don't cause more injury. I mean, because you really can. You can these prosthetics, they're wearing them all the time. They're going to get sores. And, like, well, sorry, your shoes. Skin wasn't, right, like your shoes are going to be wet. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to get bed sores on your arm because they, you, you have an improper fitted prosthetic. I've seen amputees where you take off their limb and they're, they're bleeding underneath it or they've got sores because they've, you know, they've horribly outgrown their prosthetics. I'm assuming you have a that would be a red flag. I mean, that's the extreme case, but I, I, uh, this is a third world country. Uh, right. Too, so right. We could use diabetic socks and uh, other types of foam material to you mitigate the doctors challenge. when you're doing this? Uh, so we, what we do is not considered prosthetics because there's an electronic component. So we, we are on the, the field of bionics separately. And in, a, in an academic institution with an incredibly well-tailored legal liability waiver from the lawyers that we work with, <laughs> that they accept and they understand all the terms that we now make prosthetics, so it's not approved by the FDA, and it's not designed to cure, prevent, treat any diseases, um, and they understand that they're accepting all the risks of having a prototype device. And it's very important to get the parents to understand what they're getting into, and what it's not, and what it is. Um, and so we do have some uh, medical people who are willing to lend their expertise. Um, so some of the outside groups that we've had where people have said we want to help, they've been in contact with a, like a rehab specialist or an occupational therapist um, to follow the rules of the law as well as they can. And in the larger enabled, enabled community, what's, what's um, completely consistent is that the outreach and the education to parents of the device users is to uh, watch for any sign of rubbing. If, if there's anything that looks unusual or harmful, discontinue. 
um, to if they have the ability to to get the involvement of, of an OT or of the, at least family doctor to look to, to review the advice, but that it's really up to them as parents and as a family to to watch for those things. So it's it's very clearly communicated by the community that this is this is experimental. Um, this is uh, something, the, and, and here are the things to, to watch for. Is there, on that note, is there a way for non medical professionals, non OTs, to, is there an algorithm or some kind of guide to fitting these for people? Yes. Did some lady, was there, is there a source for that information? We, we use a 3D scan. So, so we get the, 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 we're talking, again, third world country. You gotta, yeah. We can buy a printer, measure. but who's going to buy the, what's that? A tailor's tape measure. Well, the, yeah. and, and there is okay. there is a guide. Yeah, so there there is educational materials available uh, on on the blog site. But, but so to the I would so in in, in my estimate the, the the powered electrical systems are not really ready for for do it yourself assembly at this point in time. It, it would take somebody with a technical expertise to put one of these together. Um, the the unpowered devices are are something that people are starting to build themselves. And there are tutorials, resources, guides on how to um, how, how to go about the process. It's still going to be difficult and take some effort, but it is um, it is attainable by by somebody with non technical knowledge. One last question: Have you ever built a little Lego pegs on it? So we thought about this and we've talked about it, and we haven't yet. But that was one of the things we wanted to do. We we have one part I mean, that you could do it for. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we you can print Legos. The patent is a long, well, actually not that long, sorry, but it no, is expired. expired. Yeah. And and uh, we called Lego and asked them if they were interested in working on that, and we just couldn't get a hold of the right person. But we said we can give it a base, and you can do all sorts of things. And do. But that would be great. Yeah. Um, and we see there's a large part of uh, instead of just trying to recreate the human form in doll plastic, to give kids a chance to express themselves. Especially where most of their life they've been told, like, just blend in, stay below, don't let anyone bother you, you can do it. Um, we have the potential to change that. It's a paradigm. Yeah. I have special needs kids, and I don't know if they want to stay out of your life. Yeah. I have special needs kids, and I don't know if they want to stay out of your life. Did you guys see the Wolverine arm that he made? Yes. Did you have two? That was awesome. I built, I built a Lego one as well, and I built accessory systems, and uh, I put a uh, work accessory for this. We, we think it's incredible, and it's a it's about time. Like they had a hundred years to make prosthetics look like Barbie and Ken, and uh, they're finally starting to be a little bit more intriguing, at least in my perspective. Yeah, but you wouldn't believe the challenges to be able to legally make one look like Iron Man. Unless, <laughs> unless, you're, unless, you're, unless you're an individual user. So like this is what this is kind of getting into an interesting realm where um, there's a 20 year old guy who uses a, 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 a printed body-powered device, um, but he identifies himself as a, as a cyborg because he argues he's got a printer at home, he, he actually now knows how to do design work, and he has his own machine, and he's hacking his own prosthetic. And so he calls himself a cyborg because he's, he's, he argues, well, I'm using technology to modify my, my body and, and, and give it a different ability. Um, and when he breaks apart, he goes home and he prints it because he has a very labor-intensive job where he's moving 75-pound aluminum girders and stuff. And so, he keeps he keeps changing the design to match the environments in which he wants to use it. So it's kind of a that, that's a compelling thing that's starting to happen as well. And and so eventually, you know, I can see that happening with these electric systems as well. The kids that that are interested in design work in our middle school age and going into three D design, going, okay, cool. I'm going to add. Um, I want to add a light, a flashlight holder right here. He's got, <laughs> so. He can actually hold a heavy lifting job with that. He has a very specialized printing device. Yeah. Um, for, for his example, is that, an, is that an actual prosthetic for a missing limb? Or is it more of a wearable tool? Um, he's, he, he has a palm and no fingers, but it, his, his, his is not a standard uh, enable design. He's, he's taken it beyond. Is it titanium terminated, like, uh, or is it just skin terminated? Uh, so his is like a glove. It's um, custom tooled leather. Uh, for for the for the socket and, and where his palm goes, um, so he's done a lot of modifications to it. Uh, so it's it's a it's, it's a different device. Yeah. 
I uh, just wanted to know, what can somebody who's not involved in the field, if you aren't necessarily in 3D printers, if you aren't, you know, you, you're sort of a maker friendly, what can you do to get involved in, in, you know, in the projects? So there's people that get involved that bring, um, that for, for instance, bring uh, medical knowledge or legal expertise. Uh, folks that jump in that have backgrounds in graphic design or web development. Um, one of the things that's in the works is uh, something called the Handomatic, which is going to be a web app and maybe eventually a mobile app where you can type in measurements and uh, it will modify parametric design files to give you um, appropriately sized components. Um, so that's being done by some folks that have background in um, computer programming. So I guess the starting point would be check out the, the Limitless website or go to the Enable community. Um, so specifically, uh, search for Enabling the Future, which is the, the website for the Enable community. Uh, those are two good places to start. And you, you basically can send in, send in your information say, hey, here I am, I'm in this part of the world, and I have these skills that I'd be willing to contribute. And we have a guide, um, especially for universities, on our, our website, 3dhope.com. Um, and we're calling all majors when we're at our universities because we need psych psychology, we need medical, we need um, you know, engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, we need people to help with our websites, we need people to help with our legal, and it takes an entire community. And so that's like the benefit of these type of events is that we can address people in their communities and hopefully you can go and rally your community. Because it, it even changes how we address education for people with disabilities or for people with um, limb deficiency. Uh, and trying to change that and encourage science as being a tool to help people is going to take a kind of paradigm shift. No, 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 no. What time did you come in? Until then. Until then. Oh, so actually, uh, we should probably let the next uh, panel, panel come in because I guess we, we only have five minutes. Um, Could you just one. tell us you have a Facebook site, a Twitter account? Uh, you know, how do we know where to find you? So, um, so 3, 3dhope.com is a, is a, is, is a one, one landing page of the, 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 that, that would be great to go to. Uh, that's where, that's where the formative work on 3D printed open by, by, uh, by Ionic Limbs is happening. Um, the body-powered the body uh, devices um, are primarily happening at enablingthefuture.org. What's the power source for the non-body part? Oh, just mechanical. It's just leverage. Um, so uh, based upon the change in distance between two points on the body. So for instance, elbow, you know, like uh, if a not No, no for, for uh, when it's not body part. Oh, uh, power choice? I don't know if it's in here, a little light. Lion batteries, looking lion batteries. Well, th thank you all for, for coming, and um, we'll, we're all going to be here. Are you here all we get to? We're going to be floating around, so if you, you know, I'm. Um, <laughs>